Uh, good afternoon, I know it's late, so let's try to do this in a fairly easy way. I have no disclosures. Sorry guys. Okay, good. Okay, so here is what involved when we do an iliopalgenal anastomosis. We first evaluate the small bowel, we do our colectomy, we then divide the terminal ileum, so we use that ileum for our J pouch. We then assess the terminal ileum mesentery for length to make sure that the, the J pouch will reach. We then complete the, the proctectomy to remove the uh, rest of the colorectum. We make the J pouch, we then anastomose that to the anal rectum, and then we create an ileostomy. A lot of steps, a lot of stuff to do. But the question is, why do you have to know that? And I think the reason it's important for you to know that is that it guides what you see post-op in these patients. These patients, although we tell them after surgery that you're going to be cured, a lot of them are not cured. They get problems with diarrhea, they get cuphitis, they may get Crohn's disease later. That's long-term complications. There's also short-term complications, which many of our GI docs are, are interested in learning and, and taking care and following through on the patients after surgery. And I think unless you have an understanding of what happened in the operating room, you're not going to be able to take care of that patient well. Listen, when, I, when you guys send me a patient who has a cecal cancer, not related to IBD, I, I can read your op report. I know, I know exactly what I'm looking at, and that guides what I'm doing surgically. So I think it's important that you, as gastroenterologists, are able to read the, line, the lines that, you're, uh, that you see in an op report, but also in many ways read between the lines, which is what I'm going to try to give you some insight and how it helps you with the underlying diagnosis, some of the early postoperative complications that we see after J pouches, and some of the late postoperative complications. So in terms of the underlying diagnosis, okay, Obviously, when we take a patient for UC for a, for a, uh, for a J pouch, we assume they have UC. But we, we and as you, as you as well, are always weary of the potential diagnosis of IBDU, whatever you want to call that, or Crohn's disease. So when you start reading through the op report and you start seeing terms like thick and small bowel mesentery, thick and colorectal mesentery, just like Neil said, the mesentery is extremely fat and fat inf and, uh, and thickened in these patients. Small bowel look thickened and injected. I'm just giving you some examples. And obviously, if you see evidence of perianal disease when the patient was put to sleep and the anal canal was examined carefully, that should be weary of what, in fact, the underlying di diagnosis was at the patient at the time of surgery. Obviously, we're concerned about that. That has huge implications for the patients down the line in terms of how they do after surgery. What about early postoperative complications now? There's so many, many reasons why the op report influences, influences this, the need for a three-stage procedure, abdominal abscesses, various infections. A very common problem that you see is when patients have high volume stoma outputs. And one of the things that you frequently think is that, aha, the patient has Crohn's disease of the small bowel that was otherwise unrecognized. It has nothing potentially to do with that. They may have to do something we did surgically, and also a rectal stump leak, which I'm not going to talk about too much today. So what about this thing regarding three-stage and two-stage? Just to go back, we, whenever we see an ulcerative colitis patient, our initial approach is to do a two-stage procedure where the colon and rectum removed, patients usually have a temporary, uh, and the J pouch is created, excuse me, they have a temporary ileostomy. To allow the J pouch, that's two stages, to allow the J pouch to reach, however, the small bowel, which resides in the abdomen, needs to go all the way down into the pelvis, and it frequently cannot do that without help from us. And some of the things that we do are we divide the mesentery, as that's shown in this picture, to get additional length of the small bowel to reach all the way down. But sometimes we can't do that. And by the way, this is what we do if we can't reach it. Shown on the left on the slide, that's, what we, that, that's the normal colon. We try to remove the entire colon and rectum and reconstruct it, but sometimes we can't do that, and we leave the rectum in place to come back for another day when hopefully the mesentery isn't as thick. But when you start th hearing things, or rather reading things like the following, the ilocolic artery, which is the main artery that's used to create these J pouches, was identified and it was noted to be extremely fatty, infiltrated, and fibrotic. Sometimes that's, sometimes that's potentially Crohn's related, sometimes it's even steroid related. In mobilizing the small bowel down to the pelvis, there was a fair amount of thickening noted in the mesentery, tethering of the mesentery. Again, the mesentery lies here, small bowel's lying here. We gotta reach that all the way down essentially to the anal canal, tight mesentery. And sometimes you hear the, the term tissues were edematous. That's not so much in terms of issues regarding length, but it has to do with the fact that the patients have relatively poor risk, a lot of edema in the abdominal wall, 
potentially associated with a low albumin, and that is not a time to do an ileal pouch because of the potential for pouch complications, and therefore we will then use a three-stage procedure. So those are the kind of things that you should be trying to read when you read an op report in IPA. We, abdominal abscess, wound infections, fairly common after some of the things we do. Things for you to look at are spillage. Sometimes we spill things in the OR. We don't want to, but sometimes it happens. Sometimes we find a confined abscess, particularly if, they, for example, if the uh, ulcerative colitis was very severe, although obviously you can bring up the issue of whether or not it was Crohn's disease, sometimes the patients have little abscesses right next to the abdominal wall, I'm sorry, next, right next to the colonic wall that we otherwise would not be seen on imaging. The bowel was injured and repaired, and again, we just, as surgeons, kind of take that, particularly in reoperative surgery, for example, we not uncommonly see that and we fix it, we don't think too much about it. It does have our implications in terms of our infection risks after surgery. What about pelvic abscess? Pelvic abscess is one of the most feared complications of ileal pouch surgery, and it's usually related not to Crohn's disease or the J pouch. It's usually related to pouch length issues, because if you have an anastomosis that comes down into the pelvis and then secures itself to the anus, if it's under tension over time, usually within a week, it'll start separating out, and then you'll get a small hole, and then slowly but surely, some of the residual bacteria within the bowel will start creeping into that hole, and you end up with a pelvic abscess. So what you should be reading, or what the op report should say, hopefully, is the pouch was then brought down into the pelvis, assuring excellent length without any tension or any rotation, I should say, or any rotation, and brought to the anus without tension. Fantastic. Surgeon's dream. But sometimes we don't get that. And sometimes you hear words like marked tension at the anastomosis. Difficult to place sutures or close the stapler if you're doing a double staple technique. The pouch wall ripped as we sewed it in i.e. tension, it was being pulled back into the abdomen because it was under tension. Frequently, we do an air leak test, just like Neil described with a sigmoidoscope. We don't do it that complex. And when we do ileal pouch, we usually just take a bulb syringe and inject a little bit of air in. But sometimes the air leak test can be abnormal, i.e. a sign of an incomplete or, a, or a, a anastomosis. And also, sometimes words with selective mesenteric vessels were, were used, division. So sometimes we have to divide those mesenteric, the mesenteric division to get the length, but sometimes we don't have enough length. But that should be a, a red flag to you, and to obviously when you read your op report to say there was not enough length, and therefore that's the etiology of the pelvic, uh, pelvic abscess. Getting back to this high sto sto uh, volume stoma output, I'm sure you've seen this. Patients are after IPA and they're having three liters a day, four liters a day out of their stoma. Why is this happening? And again, the common scenario is, aha, unrecognized IBD of the small bowel, but that's not the case. And usually when we do these ileal J pouches, we don't want to go, we, we usually create diverting stomas. We don't want to go too far up in the stream because then we get issues regarding dehydration. We don't want to go down too far in the stream because then it makes the subsequent reoperation more difficult. So usually we gauge about approximately two feet above the top of the J pouch, but if you hear words like stoma created more proximal than normal, because the mesentery is not allowing us to bring up the part that we'd like to take, the optimal part. It was a difficult to reach stoma site, either for that reason or maybe the abdominal wall was too thick. There was a flat stoma at the time of construction, i.e. potential tension. Those are the things that should be red flags. That this is, has nothing to do with IBD and the remaining small bowel that's otherwise unrecognized, but in fact there's a high volume stoma output because the, bowel is too pro the stoma rather, is too proximal into the bowel. Those are some of the early complications. What about the later post-op complications? And unfortunately, I wish we didn't have these. Patients with diarrhea, patients with pouchitis, cuffitis, strictures, pouch fistulas and sinuses, and CD of the pouch. Let's talk a little bit about these. One of the most important things to, to look at in an op report is the type of pouch was created. And you will hear letters like J, S, and W, and I'll show what some of the J's and the S looks like, because those are the most common ones done. But the way that they're made is that all pouches usually have about a 15 to 25 centimeter limb. And if you look at the J pouch on the left, it literally, unless I'm wrong, it looks like the letter J, okay? And it's a 15 to 20 centimeter pouch. It's usually made. The pouch on the S, if you look on the, on the S pouch on, on the side, it's a little bit different. It's actually made with three loops of the intestine folded back to side to side. But it also has a small little efferent tract here. I call that the outflow tract. Okay, which is then itself connected to the anus. In the J pouch, this side here is actually connected into the anus. So you should be reading in your op report whether or not the patient had a J or an S. Why is that important? Because that's important because then when these patients don't do well postoperatively, 
hopefully you're then going to go back or potentially look at the op report and say, why is that the case? Well, how do you tell the difference between an S and a J? Well, the way you tell the difference is that the J pouch usually has ridges in it from staple lines that's shown here, okay? And the, this is this middle part, the mid part of the pouch over here. And the S pouch will have a normal, what looks like a normal tube of small bowel coming right off the anal canal straight into the J pouch itself, shown here on the left. That's one of the differences. The other difference with an S pouch is that it frequently does not have ridges because it's usually hand sewn, although sometimes it can. But what is very distinctive, which I think all of us know who do J pouch surgery and, and follow up these pages after, is this characteristic owl's eye that you will see in a J pouch, which you will not see in an S pouch. So these are some of the things that you can look at if you don't see in the op report, but um, sometimes you don't see this. And if you don't see this and you don't know what kind of pouch the patient has, you should go back to the op report. And then that, that's just showing the top of the pouch. Now what about the anastomosis type? There are many different ways to do these anastomoses, but generally the two common ways is with a stapler, where you use a, a double staple technique, or the other way, the old-fashioned way with, stu with sutures. And the things that you can look at to define, looking at the op report, is you see the words EEA, end-to-end -end anastomosis. That's a special stapler. If you hear the, see the word anvil, you see the word purse string, you see the word, uh, the comment a few centimeters above the dentate line. That implies that there was usually a double stapled anastomosis. Or if you see the word hand sewn, interrupted sutures with an anastomosis at the dentate line. What's the difference? Let me show you schematically. This is a double stapled technique. The, the rectum is shown over here. We go as low as we can, usually around the pelvic floor. The rectum is then transected with this fancy looking stapler, like this. The J-pouch is then brought down and is connected into a transanally placed um, stapler over here. This is, we call this the rod of the stapler. This is the anvil of the stapler. The anvil and the rod are connected together and closed and fired. And as Neil said before, a circular anastomosis is created. That's a circular so-called double staple anastomosis as opposed to a hand-sewn anastomosis, which is where the mucosa itself is removed now, all the way down to the dentate line usually. We use this fancy instrument to allow us to expose the anal canal. We bring the J pouch down here and we sew it usually in four quadrants first down so it's in position. And then we finish off the anastomosis as shown here in, in, with sutures. That's a hand sewn anastomosis. Now another way to look at it just very detailed schematically, again, a mucosectomy is over here. There is no, the anastomosis comes all the way down to the dentate line. If you remember from your anatomy, dentate line is white. Okay, I'll, show, I'll tell you why this is important in a minute. Okay, as opposed to a double staple technique where usually there's a little bit of mucosa that's left between the dentate line and where your staple line is up here. That's red. So you're going to have some residual red. So remember that when I show you the next slide. So how now, why is that important? Well, again, if you don't know what kind of anastomosis the patient has, that may influence what you're seeing at a pachoscopy. But this is the differences that you should be able to tell. This is what a hand-sewn anastomosis looks like. There's this ridge again that comes all the way down to the dentate line. That's white. You don't see anything in between that looks like another staple line here. Look at that ridge, okay? You will not see a ridge if this is a staple line going all the way down to the dentate line, okay? The other thing you can do is just like you do in the rectum, you can do a retroflexion maneuver in the J pouch. And you can see that the, the, sc the scope is coming right out and there's nothing in there except the pouch. Just like what looks like a normal rectum to you when you're doing a regular rectum. Okay? And the reason is that it's conforming to what we're seeing here. There's no retained mucosa. As opposed to a stapled anastomosis, where here's the, uh, the stapler, it usually forms this circular cicatrix that you can see, but here's the white. This is the white. This is the dentate line. Okay? And there's this intervening segment here of red mucosa. That's the, that's the, the mucosa which is left. Okay? That's the source of cuffitis. Okay? We'll get back to that in a minute. And this, again, is what you'd see on a retroflexion maneuver, the difference between a, a hand sewn and a staple. You can see there's this cicatrix that you see. That's, the, that's where the scope is literally at the, at the dentate line where my arrow is, but there's this retained segment of mucosa up to the dentate line on a retroflexion maneuver. So that's how you tell the difference between an ileal pouch that's a hand sewn or a staple on, on pouchoscopy. So why is that important? Well, the reason it's important is that if you're looking at a patient who's not doing well post-op, let's say they have diarrhea. You don't know if this is pure cuffitis, where the cuff is all inflamed, all the way down to the dentate line, okay? Or if, in fact, if it's cuffitis. This is a patient who had very bad diarrhea, sound, looked like, smelled like, et cetera, regular pouch pouchitis, but the pouch itself on the inside, you don't see it very well, is what was 100% normal. But the cuff is here. 
And you can see it as a cuff because, again, look at that circular cicatrix that you see and the ulceration of essentially rectum below to down to the dentate line. So that, I think, would have enormous diagnostic and therapeutic implications for you to understand how to manage this patient post-op. And all you got to do is look back at the op report to see what was done. The other thing that, that can help you with is, uh, in terms of op reports, all these patients have strictures. You will notice they'll all have, they usually have just little web-like strictures that you can just dilate with your finger, and that's perfectly fine to do. Many of them, sorry, some of them become more problematic. Some of them can be very symptomatic. But it's related to anastomotic tension. A perianastomotic leak sometimes lead that, but most importantly, don't assume it's Crohn's disease, particularly if it occurs within the first nine months to a year. That's our issue as surgeons, okay? Many times, these, as I mentioned before, these pouches, when they come down, are under tension, and one of the things that leads to strictures is ischemia, i.e. tension of that anastomosis, because it compresses the blood supply. The other thing that we can see, not so much a stricture when there's tension, but a pouch fistula or a sinus. Things like marked tension at the anastomosis, like I mentioned before, difficult to place sutures, pouch wall ripped, air leak abnormal. Basically the same thing that sort of defined what happened with the three-stage, I'm sorry, with the, with the reason you needed a hand-sewn anastomosis, I mean a stapled anastomosis, is the same concept. There was not enough tension. And again, don't assume that it's Crohn's disease within the first year. You see a patient who develops an anastomotic abscess or a pelvic abscess, let's say six months after nearly anal, and you see words like this in the op report, this may imply that this was our issue first. This has nothing to do with patient-developed Crohn's disease. And I think it's very important for you, as I keep saying, to be able to go back and, quite frankly, challenge your surgeon about that, to say, what was the tension like at the anastomosis? Was there an issue regarding that? Is, in fact, this, was this, in fact, the etiology of this patient's abscess? And this is what they'll look like. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into Fez's talk, who's next, but this is a pouch fistula. You can see, for example, number one over here. There's many different types of pouch fistulas, but this is the one going posteriorly, which is the most common. And again, it's because of tension. This wall, this anastomosis was under tension. Usually the tension on these pouches is posteriorly because of where the mesentery lies, and it pulls the anastomosis back, and as it does that, you get a leak into the presacral space. Now, if you saw this patient a month, uh, sorry, a year after surgery, and they're having poor pouch function, you'd say, aha, this patient has Crohn's disease. But if you would have potentially looked back at the op report and said, you know what, maybe this was related to some tension issue at the time, maybe it in fact has nothing to do with Crohn's disease, obviously, as I keep saying, has enormous therapeutic implications. And this is the way this thing would look at pouchoscopy. This is the pouch itself. This is the, this is the staple line. And look at the defect that you see, okay? You can see that at pouchoscopy. And obviously, the most, somewhat the most feared complication, again, over a long term, is CD of the pouch. Things that you can see, again, are very much similar to whether or not, in fact, they have IBDU or Crohn's disease at the time of surgery. Thick and small bowel mesentery. Thick and colorectal mesentery. The small bowel look thickened and injected. Small bowel and ulcerative colitis is look, supposed to look completely normal because it's not supposed to be involved. And obviously, if you see evidence of perianal disease, that should be a red flag. So in summary, re re review of the operative report has implications for your underlying diagnosis, the management of early postoperative complications, management of late post-operative outcomes. And like Neil said before, it's very important to ask the surgeon for clarification. We're actually good guys and gals. We'll, we'll answer what you want. Some people are defensive, but quite frankly, if you have a defensive surgeon, it's time to get a new surgeon. Your surgeon should be intimately involved with this care, and you should be able to ask the surgeon exactly what happened in the OR at any time. Thank you. <laughs>